It, um, thanks very much. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and I, I think I, I wanted to, before I get into the, my presentation, I did want to kind of give you a little bit of background on me. And so I, I was, um, let's see, today is Tuesday. So Sunday, I, I, I actually gave a talk in Belgium and then came in from Belgium. And on, on Sunday, I was um, sitting most of the afternoon in the Museum Tavern which any of you have been to London in the Museum Tavern, it's right near the British Museum. And um, it's a very, one of these historic pubs, and uh, it's apparently Karl Marx used to go there uh, back in the 1800s. But um, I was reminded that the first time I went to the Museum Tavern was about 25 years ago. And, um, and at that time, um, I was teaching at Duke University, and I was brought over by the National Council of Voluntary Organizations. NCBO. Any of you uh, no doubt heard of NCBO. Um, and they had their annual conference in the fall, and at that point, at that time, um, the government was introducing, for the, one of the first times, competitive tender. And so they were introducing kind of formal contracts and kind of much different performance expectations for the voluntary sector. And the voluntary sector, not unlike <laughs> I suppose academics and, and, and faculty had, for many, actually decades, had gotten public subsidies, but um, had really had a lot of autonomy to do what they wanted to do, um, and um, and weren't really subject to very strict performance expectations. But the government was introducing, um, at that time, competitive tendering, and I think over the period, if you look over the last 25 years, you've seen increasingly um, on, the, on the voluntary sector, you've seen increasingly stringent kind of expectations about performance, and, and I'm going to talk more about that in, in, in a moment. But so I, I come here as a student of both the voluntary sector, but also a student of public management and nonprofit management, and, and I think that if you, the trends that have kind of rippled through the public services um, have certainly affected higher education and the discipline of political science, and so in part, my, the title about the impact revolution is also um, uh, a, a kind of comment on what I see as a kind of restructuring of the public services and how that's affected higher education over the last 25 years, both in terms of, I mean, higher education, but it's also affected the other, other public services. And so, so that's the kind of lens I bring to this subject is, is someone who for a long time has has been studied public services and particularly the relationship between government and the voluntary sector. So, um, so uh, the discipline of political science, um, uh, you know, dates to the late 1800s, um, and APSA was founded in 1903, um, and uh, and many other disciplinary associations were founded at the same time. Um, it grew pretty slowly for a long time, but in, after the war, um, higher education expanded quite rapidly, and political science at that time became more organized. Um, we were organized as a public charity um, in the United States. EPSA was organized as a public charity in, in 1951. PSA was organized in 1950. Mm -hmm. 1950, yep. yes. Yeah. 1950. <coughs> so, um, so the post-war expansion of higher education um, uh, occurred in, after the war, and then there was also a big expansion of higher education in, in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, and again, this is during this period, 1960s, 1970s, into the 1980s, there was a, a big expansion of the public sector, um, but the voluntary sector or higher education, um, there was, you could, um, there wasn't a lot of attention to what were the outcomes. What were the outcomes of what we were doing? I mean, there was an effort to expand access, expand, um, um, invest in the public services in ways that um, uh, had not had not occurred before. That. So, um, so starting in the 1990s, you, I would argue, had quite a bit of change in the way we've approached the public services. Um, you've had budget austerity that kind of waxes and wanes. You've had periodic fiscal crises, uh, certainly. Um, in the United States, and then we've, we've gone through a series of fiscal crises in the last 25 years. Um, but also, I, I know that, again, you here in, here in the UK, you've also gone through periodic fiscal crises. Um, and then there's been the advent of new public management, 
um, which uh, is a term coined by uh, Christopher Hood, who's, I think, spoken at this conference um, um, over the years. Um, and, uh, you know, where, where essentially there's an effort to introduce a more performance, market-based orientation to the public services, more contracting for services with the voluntary sector, as I already mentioned, and increasingly, you see here in the UK as well as elsewhere in Europe and in, in the United States, increasingly contracting with the for-profit sector, um, um, increasing performance contracting, um, and, and much more uh, emphasis on evaluation um, and accountability. Um, in many ways, the, the, um, the, this kind of impact revolution and the kind of transformation of the way the public services are, 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 are being provided is encapsulated by this social impact bond. Some of you have, have, may have read about social impact bonds, which were kind of pioneered here in the UK. Um, in a kind of uh, complicated public-private partnership it, that had to do with uh, re-entry programs in Peterborough. Um, I won't go into great detail, it's very complicated, but the, the idea here is that you have, um, you bring in private investors, partner with the government, partner with the voluntary sector to deliver services in ways that are very based on, on, on performance and, and meeting certain performance targets. Um, and then, of course, there's also more emphasis on choice models in the public services, um, including vouchers, personal budgets. Here in the UK, you've gone much further in terms of personal budgets um, in the public services than we have in the United States, for example, or, or elsewhere in Europe. Um, so, so I think there's, there's been, a, a, again, a, quite a transformation in the, in the way the public services are provided, and certainly a more emphasis on performance. And so, so how is that? then affected higher education and, and the social sciences, including political science. Certainly, there's higher expectations for performance broadly defined. Certainly, there's increased expectations for promotion and tenure um, than, than there was before. Um, pressure for research transparency and data access. Um, um, uh, you'll, you'll hear me talk uh, quite a bit about research transparency and data access. Actually, the, in, some of you may have been following this DART initiative that is part of the, that's kind of rippling through not only the American Political Science Association, but political science in general, which data access and research transparency, but it has to do with a set of protocols that journal, journal editors are supposed to adopt <laughs> that, again, promotes transparency in research and, and, and data access. Um, um, ESRC, NSF policy on posting of findings and data, trying to encourage, kind of further push this research transparency and data access. Um, there's evolving standards on human subjects review in an effort to make them more rigorous, um, um, protect confidentiality, but at the same time also make the, the research process more transparent. Um, um, there's increasingly pressure to define what your learning outcomes are. Um, in the United States, this is pressure is coming from, in many ways, from all sides. The, we have accrediting bodies in the United States that accredit universities, and increasingly they're requiring faculty to identify what the learning outcomes are of their courses, um, um, and, and identify what the competencies are that you get from you know, from taking a course in political science, what are the expectations around learning outcomes and student competencies. Um, and certainly there's also been more rigorous review of departments and schools than there was 25 years ago. And, and I know you have a, you have a much, you, you have a, a, a kind of national process here for review that we don't have in the U.S., but nonetheless there still is also in the U.S. a, a more rigorous process for departments and schools. Um, Okay, so um, there's also been, I think, in somewhat related, but there are also some other trends that are also shaping higher education. Um, increase in part-time adjunct, contingent faculty, increase in term faculty that are on term contracts for some period of time, but with no expectation that they'd be permanently employed. Um, again, kind of fits into the kind of more emphasis on efficiency that's part of the new public management and the kind of emphasis on market-based uh, strategies. Um, and again, relatedly, new institutional models of higher education, certainly much more emphasis on online education, um, and partly I, with the hope that this is 
more efficient, but also the idea is that there's a way of meeting more demand for higher education, um, much more emphasis on executive education, growth of part-time students, um, part-time programs, um, different kinds of university models than had existed you know, uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, um, and certainly you see that in the United States where you have all kinds of different university models, including quite a few for-profit university models, um, some of which are quite controversial, um, to say the least. Um, um, but, and, and, um, and many of them are highly dependent upon government and government loans. I mean, it's really, it's, uh, it's uh, there's, so there's been quite a bit of scandals with these kind of for-profit universities in the United States. And so I'm not saying that this is the wave of the future, but certainly the, the, the emergence of these different alternative models has then, you know, is, is rippling through higher education. Um, uh, so, um, and then there's relatedly new standards and expectations for research, um, widespread utilization of the impact factor and citation indices for promotion and ranking of journals, um, and of course they're related, right, because your, the idea is that you want to, you're expected to publish in journals that have high impact factors, and, and departments now use that, the impact factor to rank journals, which then um, help set ex expectations for promotion. Um, um, <clears throat> and then you have, you know, more emphasis on research funding, <coughs> excuse me, um, um, as a measure of scholarly quality, and the expectation is that you're going to, if you're on a research track, um, that there's certain expectations about how much research funding that you're going um, to have. I, I, I was in Belgium, as I mentioned, I was in Belgium giving, giving a talk, um, uh, last week, and I was talking to one of my colleagues there, and she was talking about how there's a, there's now in Belgium a, she's got tenure, but now there's a kind of research track and a teaching track once you get to be associate, and the research track has expectations about what kinds of journals you publish in, but also <coughs> expectations about research funding, and so she has to kind of make a choice now about whether to pursue the research funding track or the teaching track. You know, again, if you think about it, quite a quite a revolution in in the role of the faculty over the course of the last 25 years. Um, so, um, <clears throat> um, and and then it, I think related again, relatedly, a lot of these trends are all related, right? So, departmental and individual review processes emphasize disciplinary journal publications. The argument is that diminishes the incentive to publish in, to do interdisciplinary work or to publish in interdisciplinary type journals. And again, this gets back to the top point about impact factors and citation indexes and, 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 um, and publishing in interdisciplinary journals may not have this high an impact factor, even though it may be good for your career in some ways, may be good for your research, but it, under the current evaluation systems, it's not necessarily incurred. Um, so, so that, you know, the standards around research and evaluation uh, for faculty are, are, have dramatically changed. Um, and then there's also some dem important demographic changes that have occurred within the discipline that I think are also important to keep in mind. Um, certainly there's been more internationalization, including the growth of the discipline in non-OECD countries. So, um, so there's, you know, APSA has grown. Over 25, over 25 percent of our membership now is from outside the U.S. Um, uh, there's been a big growth in in the political science profession in Asia, um, as well as in Af increasingly in Latin America and Africa. Um, there are, are more women, ethnic minorities in the discipline than ever before, um, and there's also more subfield diversity um, and the growth of affinity groups and specialized associations, which in part is, I, I would argue, in this is something that interacts with the new evaluation systems, right? Because you're, um, um, in terms of subfield diversity, there's an emphasis on working within, you know, if you're interested in comparative politics, or if you're interested in African politics, or if you're interested in um, um, NIR, certainly you need to be well known within those subfields in order to get to learn about research opportunities, to learn about what journals to publish in, to make your contacts in professional networks. And, and so, um, 
So you see the growth of more specialized associations, um, the growth of sections. APSA 25 years ago had no sections whatsoever. We, have, we were just one big association. And now we have over 40 sections, some of which have like well, close to 700 or 800 members. Um, and so, you know, ISA, you know, now has 6,000 people, I think, at their conference, which concluded last week. Some of you may have gone. Um, but, you know, it's, it's evolved into a large, very large association with about 50% international membership. So it's a, um, it's a big organization, and they, have, they also have affiliates, as, as you know, around the world. Um, so, so that this is also, I, I think, been encouraged by the changing nature of <coughs> higher education and the changing nature of the research and evaluation process. Um, um, and then, of course, there's also increasing interest in experimental methods. Um, uh, which is certainly something that's sweeping through the social sciences. Um, and, you know, whether you're in econ or sociology or political science, they're certainly much more interested in experimental methods. Um, and indeed, one of the fastest growing sections in APSA is the experimental methods section, uh, which has gone from virtually no members to several hundred now. Um, and, and so, so that, and as I'll mention in a minute, the, the, the kind of growth in experimental methods also raises all kinds of questions about what, the, what is the discipline, what, what do we do as, as political scientists, um, ethical questions about, you know, um, that, that are related to issues around experimental, experimental methods and experimental research. Um, so, um, okay. So the debate about impact, and I don't mean to try to this is to make the you know the definitive statement on impact. I think a lot of these issues are complicated. There are reasonable people can disagree about them. For example, experimental methods. Some people will say that experimental methods are fine. We should be doing more of it. And then some people in the discipline think that this is going to be the death knell of the discipline. So I don't mean to suggest that I'm going to answer all these questions today, but I do think that. Um, um, you know, so the, the concern of the discipline is the focus on impact will na somehow narrow the discipline and, and reduce the diversity of methodological approaches, um, more specialization, um, less incentive for dis interdisciplinary work, and less emphasis on qualitative and interpretive research. Um, and certainly this, this issue, this issue in particular, is, has, has lots of flashpoints in the discipline. The whole debate about data access and research transparency and the DART initiative is partly related to what's the future role of qualitative and interpretive research within the discipline. And it also concerned about that protocols in terms of journals means that that's going to help influence who gets into journals, which will then affect promotion, which then will affect you know, who's running departments, and so the ripple effects of the DART initiative and the emphasis on data access and research transparency will, will have far-reaching effects on the discipline over time. And so, so that's one, I think, one reason why the, the issue about DART and adopting these, these standards of data access and research transparency, which on their face of it seem like, well, a lot of it seems reasonable. Who could be against research transparency, right? who could be against data access, um, have, I think, been, become a, a real source of controversy within the, within the discipline because it, it gets played out in, you know, the, the, again, the, the implications of, of DART for the discipline, I think, are potentially quite profound. And this is the argument that many people, including Jeff Isaac and, and others, have made in, in print and on blogs and on the plot. You've probably been reading the plot. Plot. Do you know, people know what the plot is? The plot is um, a new blog started by Cambridge that's based at Oxford. Ray, Ray Dutch <laughs> is running it. And, and so he's, he's published some pieces by Jeff uh, on, the, on the DART initiative, right? the, you know, Jeff's critiques of the DART initiative. Um, um, and so um, I think DART is also not unrelated, the DART and the whole push for research transparency is not unrelated to the, the push for open access 
Um, and, uh, um, uh, you know, because the, and it's also not unrelated to the pressure for, you know, um, more, more impact um, by, um, by both the social sciences and, and political sciences in particular. Um, and I was personally reminded of this recently because I, I have an article that um, I, I, one of my one of the colleagues I've worked with over the years is Chris Kelcher at the University of Birmingham. Some of you know, you know Chris, uh, but he and I have written an article together that got published in Public Administration that then um, the University of Birmingham paid to be open access because they wanted to have uh, increase the citation uh, the citations that for our paper that would then affect the review process for the department. And so again, again, think about how life was different 25 years ago and how where we are now that the incentive for open access is that it influences citation counts in part, but it also, the, the, the push for open access is um, uh, related to the idea that open access uh, promotes more research transparency. And it, can, it promotes more experimentation in, in research, and it promotes more, you know, you can um, do, do more with data access and that, than you would otherwise be able to do with it in, in a traditional type of journal, subscription journal, even one that is primarily, for example, online. There are plenty of journals now that are primarily online, but um, our traditional subscription model. Um, and with open access, you have, you have rolling publication. You don't have, you don't have. I mean, a true, a, a complete. Again, open access is a very complicated topic. I'm happy to talk about it um, because there are different types of open access journals. And but, uh, APSA has decided to launch an open access journal, and um, <laughs> and we're currently searching for an editor. In case any of you are interested, um, we're currently searching for an editor, and the deadline is May 15th. But. Um, 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 but uh, the you know the idea here is you'd have rolling publication that the um, uh, that you'd have immediate publication and it would be an effort it would be a way of people getting their research out more quickly. This would potentially have help people, junior scholars who need to increase their their presence in in the, in the research community. Um, so there are a lot of there are a lot of potential benefits for open access <coughs> journals that tie into the push for research transparency and data access that are related also to the expectations for higher productivity on the part of faculty. Um, now, it is also true that open access, there are a lot of not very good open access journals out there, and so that, that open access has a, I think in many people's minds, has a poor <coughs> reputation but a high quality, peer reviewed, um, open access journal could potentially have quite a bit of benefit for political scientists um, and, and it ties into some of these points that I've been making about research transparency and data access. Um, okay, uh, so um, the debate about impact is also related to the debate about policy relevance and public engagement. And, and so, um, so a lot of the, the, the <coughs> way I was just talking about impact with more emphasis on citations, uh, impact factors, um, um, you know, publishing in the top journals as rated, you know, as, as, as rated by their impact factor. Um, that's, that's one way of thinking about impact. Another way of thinking about impact that's gotten a lot of attention in the discipline is also the impact on, on policy and politics. Um, and, and so I think there's concern in the discipline that the push for a certain kind of impact that I was just talking about where you're, talking, you're focused more on, on, more on methods, more on publications, more on publishing in top political science journals, and more emphasis on experimentation, experimental methods, is leading us, leading the discipline away from engagement in the world of policy and politics. Um, and, and so that's another, it seems to me, a kind of fault line in the discipline. APSA had a task force um, on public engagement a couple years ago where the, um, 
the, the task force to say, well, how can we, as a discipline, become more engaged with the policy world and, and um, um, what can political scientists do to continue to do their research but also be engaged in the, in the, in the, the, policy, the policy world and, and the public sphere broadly defined. Um, and I, I think that this is a, I mean, again, if you looked at the API, the American Political Science Review and any number of uh, um, other journals 30 years ago, there was, a, there was certainly a different kind of orientation to the world of politics and policy than you have today. Um, and and the, other, the other point I would make is that it's also true that public administration 30 years ago was also much more centrally part of political science than it is today. Um, and that is, um, re that reflects many different trends in political science in the last 30 years, but including the growth of public policy programs, um, and, um, but it's also um, the split from public administration programs from political science, um, and it, but it also reflects, I think, the kind of changing emphasis of the discipline and, and kind of away from um, um, public administration, which is a more, in some, you know, most people who are in the public administration are much more interested in, in kind of applied work and, and, and often have very direct connections to government administrators or, or people in, or, or civil society organizations. Um, so, so I think that this is an important issue about how do you think about, how do you think about influence in the policy realm? And how do you evaluate that? And so some departments and some, you know, I mean, I think there's more interest in trying to assess that today about, and, but it's also, as all of you know, very complicated to assess your, your impact. You know, do you, how many, how many op-ed pieces you had, or do you talk about how many times you testified in, before a legislative body? Uh, I mean, there are a variety of ways that you could try to measure public engagement and policy influence, but it certainly is a much more complicated and challenging type of thing than, say, counting how many citations you have. So it's it's an important, I think it's a central issue for the discipline today, uh, because we're also being widely, at the same time this is happening, we're also being widely, I'll, I'll jump to this point, we're, you know, we're being also criticized by policymakers that we're not, that we're too removed from the kind of Real, real world goals of um, of the government. You know, in the United States context, some of you may have, have followed the the last few years. There were even at some at one point a couple of years ago, the Congress had placed restrictions on political science on, on the funding by the National Science Foundation of, of research by political science science because it had to tie into national security and the economic development of the United States, or else you couldn't fund it. So like. The voting studies, the traditional voting studies that the political scientists have done, weren't going to be funded by the National Science Foundation because of this restriction. So there's also been a connection between the perception that, and, and criticism of political science that it's not policy relevant anymore, and the kind of increasingly hostile attacks, by at least from some quarters in, in the United States context, about. Um, um, uh, whether political science is, is sufficiently, uh, the kind of research it does is contributing in some way, broad way, to the national interest. Um, so, so I, again, I think that the, the criticisms of, of, the, of the, the political science are related to this concern about what's the relationship between the discipline and, and the work, real world of policy. Um, and you know, I've already I've already talked about um, uh, political the. To a certain extent, I already talked about the push for more experimental methods and experimental design. Um, but the, the whoa, um, I've mentioned here this Montana judicial election case, which I think encapsulated some of the, the challenges I think the discipline faces as we move more into um, experimental methods. Just briefly, there were um, three political scientists um, got quite a bit of money to study the Montana judicial election in 2014, where there were candidates running for, um, uh, in this ostensibly nonpartisan election. And they wanted to test whether if people, if, if citizens knew 
what the political leanings of the ju judges were, would that change their vote? And so they, they did a mailing um, that looked like an official state government mailing and, and mailed it to, I don't know, like 100,000, I mean, residents. I mean, it was a lot of people. And essentially in the middle of the election, and, and then, of course, when the state officials found out about us, they weren't happy that political scientists were sending out fake, um, <laughs> fake brochures on, uh, on these judges. And so, um, so that then prompted a lot of angst within the American political science community about, you know, when is it appropriate to do experiment, political experiments and, um, you know, and, and some people would make the argument and, you know, that there are a lot of political scientists that work for the World Bank and they're trying to intervene in elections in, you know, many developing countries in many ways, you know, so how is, how is what they're doing different than the kind of experiments that are being run in Montana? So this is a big topic, I think, and actually APSA is planning on, uh, the current president-elect of APSA, David Lake, is planning to have create a, a task force on the kind of ethics and of political experiments um, that uh, over, so you'll hear more about it over the course of the next year. Um, so so I, I think, again, this is another big issue. It's related, I think, to this kind of push for impact and, and what, I've, what, I've titled, what I've called in my title, the impact revolution. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and I would just, Make, make one more one more point, which was also another, you know, bad example of political experiments. But there was this McClure Don Green controversy that that occurred, where there was a political science um, doctoral student who did a who did a political experiment, and come to find out, and he had amazing results. And he got cited, you know, he got awards, and then it found out that he had actually kind of faked some of his results, you know, and so that the you can't control that, right? I mean, people do that, you know, but, but the point is that it was the incentive to fake the results was driven in part because they, he wanted to get some important effects from his, his research. So, um, okay, so where do we go from here? You know, again, I, I think there's all these controversies. I'm not trying to say that we that I, I have all the answers to this. I'm kind of, I feel like I'm kind of in the middle of these, and so I don't, I don't actually try to, I try not to take sides in some of these disputes, given my, that I have, perhaps as a very <coughs> association. Um, I do think that with data access and research transparency, um, I think that there, it's a, it's very complicated, and there needs to be broad stakeholder involvement and consultation, engagement with qualitative and quantitative researchers, um, and, and I think that there needs to be um, um, certainly an effort to, to bring in particularly the qualitative community where standards around data access and research transparency are, are not as fully developed and are more complicated. Um, and, and there are complicated issues around confidentiality, human subjects review, all kinds of issues that qualitative researchers and people who do interpretive methods face that um, that quantitative researchers don't face. And so I think that to, to the extent that we're pushing qualitative methods, I mean, qual to the extent that we're pushing impact and we're pushing research transparency and data access, I think that there, there needs to be more investment, both by journal editors, by the association, in, in, in adapting qualitative methods and qualitative research to these new expectations. Um, I, I do think, I've already talked to a certain extent about this open access issue. I think that open access is, is only going to continue to become more prominent in the, in, the, in, in the academic publishing world and political science as well as the other social sciences will, will be faced with that. Um, I think you're seeing more open access journals there um, and, uh, and increasingly there will be an expectation by funders that, that that the research findings of political scientists and social scientists will be, will be made available as quickly as possible. Now what that does to the economic model for 
publishing houses like Cambridge University Press or SAGE or the economic model of academic associations, that's another question, right? Because the business model for both academic associations as well as publishers is based upon a subscription model. So as we move towards open access, which has a completely different business model, you know, what is, how does that relate to the, to the business model for academic associations and, and, and publishing companies? So, um, but I, I, st I still, I mean, it's, to me, open access is here to stay, and you're going to see more open access in various ways, because again, there's it's open access, it's, it's not just open access journals, but there's open access where, like my article that's now open access. I mean, there are lots of different ways that, to promote open access that's short of just a, a, a whole journal devoted to open access. Um, um, and I, I do think public engagement um, with better communication with policy makers, more interest in the public sphere about political science, I think that, um, I think enhancing the diversity of the profession on many different dimensions, I think will also help with um, enhancing public engagement. And so to the extent that associations like APSA can help promote the diversity of the profession, again, broadly defined, I'm not talking about just one type of diversity, I think that will also help with promoting public engagement. Um, and um, um, I, I thought it would also be interesting to, to kind of talk about how APSA has also been approach this subject in the, in, because we've, we've been in the midst of a strategic planning process at APSA um, and one of the things that we've tried to do is come up with a vision statement for APSA which required us to think about well, what do political scientists do um, and um, because we had no vision statement we also had no mission statement so we had to come up with a mission statement for the association and, then, and a vision statement and so um, so the American Political Scientist so promotes scholarly understanding of political ideas, norms, behavior, and institutions to inform public choices about government, governance, and public policy. And, and one of the things that was interesting about this debate we had about this vision statement was that there were people on the APSA Council that had a more, who wanted a more normative statement that we as APSA and we as political scientists are devoted to social justice, equity, democracy, and um, versus the, and then, and then as soon as people would say that, then people would say, well, that's not what I do. I do objective social science where I'm pursuing truth no matter where it leads me. And, and so this statement in some ways is crafted as a compromise between <laughs> people who wanted a more normative statement and people who um, saw what political scientists do as, as more objective social science. Um, but I think that the reason why I think a vision statement is important because I think that we, we as a discipline need to be able to communicate to citizens, we need to communicate to policymakers what we do. Um, and we need to say, well, this is what we, this is what a political scientist does. Is there anything that unites all of these different uh, people who are at PSA or at APSA conferences? Um, is there something that you could say we share together in terms of what we do, given that we have such diversity of methods, such diversity of research interests? Um, um, you know, is there something that unites all political scientists? And in some ways, you know, we're in. I mean, every, every academic discipline is diverse in some ways, but you know, you can make an argument that sociology has a, has a kind of, in some ways, there's a kind of normative basis to sociology that, that political science hasn't necessarily um, uh, adopted. And so, so this is our effort to craft a kind of way of, of connecting all political scientists and to communicate to, I think, to the outside world. To, Increasingly, I think that's important that we be able to communicate this is what we do and this is what we study. Um, and it kind of fits into this emphasis on public engagement. Also fits into this emphasis on the expectation that political science is having an impact, right? So we're, we're having, you know, scholarly understanding of political ideas, norms, and behavior and institutions to inform public choices about government, governments and governance and public policy. Um, 
and, and, and so, you know, I, I think that my personal view, again, putting aside, I've tried not to say my personal view, but it should strive to influence and inform policy and politics. That's, that's the draft APSA vision statement. Um, I do think that also the, the diversity of methodological approaches of, of political science profession is also one of its strengths. And, and so, um, so again, that's partly related to my, my point about that I've made about DART and how we move forward with DART and supporting um, people who both do quantitative as well as qualitative methods. Um, and, um, and I think that there's, uh, there's an important role for associations in this process as well in kind of coping with this impact revolution. Um, uh, rethinking the annual meeting and conference to promote more networking, research innovation, hybrid presentation models. Um, I think that, you know, there's been a lot of discussion um, in, in the world of associations about how kind of conferences um, um, are, are kind of faced with lots of different external forces that are, are at one level reducing the incentive that people have, traditional incentives that people have to go to conferences. Right? I mean, it used, you know, when I entered the profession in 1982, you had to go to the conference to learn about the cutting edge research. You, you, this is where you did networking. This is where you met people. Um, well, you don't need to go to the conference anymore to learn about cutting edge research. You can just go online. Um, and, and, um, and so the traditional incentives to go to the conference, and it's also true that the presenting at the conference used to be a measure of quality. Right? So if you presented at the American Political Science Association or the PSA meeting, that that was a mark of your standing in the field, which then helped you back at your home department. Well, you know, people don't care about that anymore in terms of whether your, your evaluation, right? If you present at the American Political Science Association meeting, they're still going to look at how many citations you had, and that's the one that's, or how, how good a teacher you are. And, that's, and so those kind of traditional incentives about the conference have changed dramatically. Um, what I would argue is that there's still a, a big demand, there still is a, a, an important demand for face-to-face -face meeting with people that you can't, you can't substitute the web for it or phone calls or email. And, and, but I do think that there needs to be innovation in the way the conferences are, are run to, to kind of help the profession and help the membership kind of cope with the, the increasingly higher expectations around um, research and, and teaching. Um, um, we're, we're making a modest effort in this regard this year where we're introduced more diversity in format. So we've got everything from teaching cafes to author meets critics to, you know, 30 minute research presentations followed by two discussants. I mean, we've, we've moved away as much as we can from the um, traditional panel model, recognizing that people still need to get on the program in order to get their department to pay for them to come, and so there's still there's still lots of pressure to have more traditional kinds of research panels. But I, I think that the conferences need to be reinvented um, in ways that I think tie into some of these changes that are, have affected higher education and the discipline in general. Um, and and I think that. Um, Support for the doctoral pipeline, including alternative careers for political scientists. I think we as an association um, need to invest in, in doctoral education and, and, and also help with, um, um, help them cope with the kind of changing expectations that they're facing. Um, um, and then uh, support for improved pedagogy, adaptation of teaching methods to the changing context of higher education. Um, one of the things that we're um, trying to do now with our website is to post material in there about grading rubrics, um, assessment. I mean, faculty are now coping with the need to come up with various kinds of rubrics, identify learning competencies, um, new forms of assessment of students that in ways that they didn't have to before. And I think associations can play a useful role in helping faculty deal with some of these new expectations. Because many faculty have for, <coughs> gone along for a long time thinking that, well, um, that the way you evaluate performance is through your exams, right? Or through grading, you know, through the paper, the grade on papers. Well, that's not, you know, 
in, in the current era, you can't just rely upon grades to, uh, to evaluate your, your, your students. Um, so, um, so, so I think this is an important role for associations. Again, I've already talked about the innovations and methods of presentation. I think which also can be fostered by, um, this ties into what I, I meant before about open access, but also the changes um, that we're, we're trying to do in the conference. Um, um, and then um, uh, just a couple other quick points here. I don't, I don't want to take too long. Um, um, as I mentioned, AFSA plans a task force on ethical issues and political experiments, um, and I, I think this is a really important issue. Um, and then there's complex issues. AFSA is an association, I find that we've gotten more engaged in issues around human subjects. There are a lot of people within the profession who are um, quite concerned about uh, issues around human subjects review and regulations around human subjects, um, uh, given some of the trends in the profession. So I think there's a useful role for the association in, in helping faculty address these kinds of issues too. So, um, so in conclusion, I would say that the pressure for greater impact on many dimensions is transforming higher education, social science research, and the discipline of political science. Um, um, and then I think political science, and, the, uh, and as well as the association, needs to invest broadly in thinking about what that impact is. Because again, I think there is a risk that there's a that we could, you know, end up with kind of narrow definitions of what the impact is of what we do in our teaching as well, both on the research side as well as on our teaching side. And I think that we as a profession need to think broadly about what the impact is. And that ties into some of the points I made about public engagement um, and, and influencing policy. Um, um, and then I think we also need to support innovation and methodology, both individually as well as collectively as an association. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.